Welcome back everybody. Today we are in a special location as you guys can probably tell. We're here with Eric from the Iraq Veteran 8888 channel. I think I got them all in there. And uh, I'm down here of course we're filming a few videos. But one I really wanted to get into was black powder. So um, I didn't grow up around guns as many of you here know. So I didn't grow up with black powder like a lot of people did learning from their father and stuff like that. So really everything I know about black powder is probably from Eric and Takeout 45. So <laughs> the only black powder gun I've ever shot in my life, even before coming down here, was with Eric. So, I mean, everything I've learned, which isn't a lot, which is why we're doing this video, has been from him. So he has a ton of experience with it, obviously. And what I wanted to do today was just like a black powder 101. So the basics, covering just uh, different powders, different projectiles, um, some on some of the guns that you can use them in or stuff like that. But there's sure. A lot of differences in there, so I guess we'll start out. What powders? Say yeah. So so really, there there's a lot of people that just have a, a confusing disarray of knowledge when it comes to black powder and what it's all about. So the basic way we look at it: when you think gunpowder, you think smokeless powder. I mean, most modern shooters, mm -hmm. you think of a 308 or a 556 or something. It uses a smokeless powder, which has nitrocellulose in it. Very very different composition. Uh, smokeless powder is considered a propellant. Uh, that's why you know it's so awesome in modern cartridges because you can use flash retarders like a lot of the IMR powders you use flash retarders which are great for military use because obviously in a military situation you don't want the gun to give off a lot of flash, you don't want it to kick up a lot of dust, you definitely don't want a huge puff of black smoke coming out of the end of the gun. So black powder is a little bit antiquated by today's standards but Black powder is still a really, really fun thing that a lot of people do to honor history, uh, also shoot older firearms, and it, it is kind of just one of those neat things. Like, there's something cool about squeezing the trigger and a big puff of smoke coming out of the end of the gun. Black powder is considered an explosive. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit. Um, the, the DOD or DOJ or DOD uh, classifies black powder as an explosive. So storage requirements, if you look at a business that carries black powder, if they have over a certain amount of black powder in their place of business, they actually have to have a special container to put the stuff in to store it when it's you know being displayed and everything like that. That's why a lot of shops won't carry re what they call real black powder. They will carry substitute black powder. Substitute black powder has a lot of the similar um, attributes to black powder, but is not subject to the same storage requirements as real black powder. Um, Smokeless, or, or this type of powder is considered smokeless powder, so it's not subject to the same transportation requirements, storage requirements, and things like that. So black powder is pretty volatile, but for its volume, it is relatively weak. Right. Um, about 50% of, of, of the actual physical uh, charge of the powder actually gives off all its energy. So you're losing about 50% right out the gate, so it's, it is weaker. Uh, the way that the powder is basically, the way you determine more or less the power is basically the burn rate. Okay. So you have like 1F, 2F, 3F, 4F. 4F is the finest powder available. It burns the fastest. So it's a very high energy yield with a very small amount of powder. 4F is what they use for what they call pan powder. Uh, in a flintlock or any type of, um, you know, weapon that uses uh, a type of, of flash powder to ignite the main charge in the barrel, uh, the finer powders like 4F are used for that purposes. Uh, you know, and then getting into 3, 2, and 1F, the larger the granule, the slower the burn rate, and it depends on the bore size that you're using as to which powder you're going to use for certain applications. Most of your cannons use what's called cannon grade powder, and it's huge granules, like often the size of like a pea. Okay. It's huge granules. 1F is what you use in like shotguns, fouling pieces, uh, large bore guns. Like if you have a 75 caliber uh, smooth bore uh, musket or something big, 1F would be used in, in, you know, a slower powder would be used in a lot of your uh, larger calibers. So, so could you, like, is it safe to say, um, there's something that would typically have the 1F, could you use 4F in it safely? No. Okay. No, you would not, you do not want to do that. 4F okay. is used primarily only for uh, pan priming purposes, priming purposes. Uh, you, do, you would not use 4F as a main charge. Uh, most of your uh, black pow powder use is pretty much going to come down to the 2F powders, what I primarily use the most of. All right, so I guess without getting too far down the rabbit hole of like black powder shooting, 
you have a couple of different systems for shooting black powder. You have a muzzle loader. Okay, so in a muzzle loader, you basically you pour the powder down the barrel, seat the projectile, and then you have a percussion cap that sets off the charge. And that percussion cap can be delivered by a variety of different mechanisms. You can either have what they call a commercial or small type number 10 or number 11 commercial spec uh, nipple that accepts this little per percussion cap, yep, yep. and that sets off the charge. And this is what the silencer co used, right? Uh, no, oh. we're going to get into that in a moment. Scratch so that's that. the one gun that's that he's, at, he's had access to. <laughs> All right, then you have what's called a four-wing musket cap. Musket caps are what the military guns would use. So okay. if you have like an old Whitworth or an old uh, infield musket or whatever the case may be, you use a four-wing musket cap, and you see that the the size of the nipple that this cap is designed to go on is much larger than the commercial one. It's about double. Because a military gun, you're a military guy, you yep. want reliability, right? Over you anything. want as much fire right. getting down that hole as possible to set that charge off. So sure. the four wing musket caps are for your military guns. Hmm. All right, and then on your inlines, they use 209 primers, and a 209 okay. is basically the same type of primer you would use in a shotgun okay. shell. Okay, and these are very hot primers. And those look like they're sealed, are those sealed? Uh, well, no, not exactly. I mean, you still have the, the priming compound exposed right, on, right, yep. on this part. But the thing about inline muzzle loaders is everything is on an inline. On a percussion cap, usually the nipple hangs off to the side and you have an external hammer that drops on it and sets it off. And an inline system, it's all in a single line. So that's why guns like the Silencer Co., like the Maxim, have an internal striker mechanism and it's all in one line. It gives uh, better, more consistent ignitions, better velocities and ultimately a lot more reliability too. So a lot of modern hunters use what they call inline muzzle loaders that are primed with 209s because it's more reliable in the field. If you're gonna use a muzzle loader for hunting, a lot of people want the 209 inlines because if they're gonna take a shot at the deer of a lifetime, they don't wanna hear fizzle pop or thud or clack and no bang. Right. So muzzle loaders do have their intricacies that you have to be very careful with in order to get them to go off right. Uh, black powder is hydroscopic, which means that it readily, readily absorbs every bit of moisture it possibly can. So in a situation where, you know, you're in a rainy environment and you've been sitting in the deer stand for four or five hours and your charge uh, gathers up a whole bunch of moisture, guess what? It may not go off. Right. So you have to keep your black powder uh, dry and keep it from, you know, readily absorbing uh, moisture. So that's one part of it. So black powder is made of sulfur potassium nitrate and charcoal uh, with a few other odds and ends, but that's the main gist of black powder. When black powder sets off, it releases this huge cloud of smoke and it leaves behind a very corrosive residue. If you don't clean it, it will immediately rust your gun to heck and back. Absolutely. And for those of you who aren't used to it, but are used to like corrosive uh, surplus Russian ammo, so it's like the 7N6, um, some of the 762 by 54 loads, but like way worse. Yes. Uh, but like five times worse. So, you know, 7 and 6 can be nasty, especially if you live in human environments in the South, but this stuff is like five times that. So It can. Yeah. So in terms of mechanisms, not only do you have the front stuff for variety, you have, uh, you know, your commercial uh, percussion cap, your military four wing, you have a 209. Those are your basic percussion caps. Uh, you also have cartridge contained black powder as well. So you look at something like 4570. All right, well, right. why is a cartridge called 4570, right? Why is it called that? You ever I, wonder? I don't know. 45 <laughs> projectile on 70 grains of black powder. Okay. Here, I have a 4440 uh, case. This is a 44 projectile on 40 grains of black powder. So anytime you see those, those designations, like 3040 crag, right. 30 cal grains. bullet on 40, 40 grains, grains of powder. Okay. So a lot of those old designations get their name because of the amount of powder. So if I picked up a 45 110 uh, custom rifle, how many grains of powder would that 45 110 have it? 110. 110 grains of powder. So question on that one then, for modern, like I have a 45 70 and it's not black powder. So how are they, how are they basically making those projectiles to okay. st still fit the same? That's diameter? a very good question. So, you know, Older style firearms like a Springfield trapdoor or whatever mm -hmm. or rolling block or something chambered in 4570 is not the same gun as like a Marlin guide gun that's like or a Ruger number one that's a modern gun. There you go. Modern mm -hmm. full power 4570 loads and original trapdoor loads are two very different animals and many times reloading manuals will have separate data for each of those particular gun types. 
because you wouldn't want to take a Ruger number one, full bore, 500 grain, awesome shoulder kick and load and stuff it in the trap door because you'll likely blow the gun up. Right. The guns weren't made to take uh, that pressure of cartridge. Later, reloaders, once smokeless powder came about, they found obviously that with smokeless powder, you could make 4570 really grow some legs and do some awesome stuff. That is outside the scope of this video, but in terms of safety, right. that is very important. <clears throat> Original guns that are chambered for black powder and black powder cartridges should never use smokeless powder. The two are not uh, interchangeable at all, with a few very specific ex uh, exceptions uh, to that rule are out there. I mean, like, for instance, this is an old Damascus mm -hmm. uh, cape gun, a German cape gun, and it has a rifled 20-gauge Paradox barrel on the right. I would not load this gun with smokeless powder. I don't care how light the charge is. I don't care what some manual or Uncle Bob told you. Don't do it. If it's twist steel, you don't want to fire that gun with anything but, but black powder. Sure. Okay. Black powder generates generally lower pressures than smokeless powder, but it depends. There's also a pressure curve, guys. So smokeless powder gives a pressure curve a lot of times that is gradual along the entire length of its burn rate as it leaves the barrel, whereby the pressure curve on black powder is instant. Once that, boom, it blows up. It's literally an explosion inside of the case when you shoot black powder. That, that pressure is instantly realized right here in the breech end. And you're gonna get some residual pressure curve a little bit, but most of your pressure is contained right there in your face. So you have to make sure that you're not playing games when it comes to black powder. All right, so we talked a little bit about cartridge contained. So with cartridge contained, you can take just about any cartridge and load it with black powder if you want. I could load black powder 9mm. I could load black powder 45 ACP if I want. Sure. Um, I could load black powder 4570 and shoot it out of a modern guide gun if I want. Yep. That's completely fine. Many shooters will take uh, modern guns and do like what they call cowboy action loads. So if a guy buys a brand new Uberti single action uh, revolver in 45 Colt, he can definitely load black powder 45 Colt to get the original effect of like the, the smoke and all that. Sure, know? and if you guys watch Hickok 45, as I'm sure the majority of you do, yeah. you'll see him do that all the time in videos. So that's how I do that. So. <laughs> yeah, black powder, guys, is one of those things that, um, you know, it's it can be confusing to some people, but there are, man just like there's reloading manuals for smokeless powder, there are manuals out there that follow the intricacies of black powder and what to do with them. Now, getting on the substitutes, we talked a little bit about gun designs. I know I'm kind of going a little bit all over, but I'm just, you know, it's a lot of information, guys, so bear with me here. Right. Uh, so, substitutes. All right, substitutes are considered smokeless, but they are far from it. Substitutes still uh, leave behind nasty residue. It's still hydroscopic, still absorbs moisture, it's still corrosive. There's nothing different about it. There's just some additives that they put in it that for whatever reason, it's not an explosive. So right. it's just it's just a classification thing. Guys, you should still clean substitutes just like you would clean uh, standard black powder. Now, talking about cleaning. Uh, to clean black powder, the best thing really to use is hot soapy water, hot water. Right. Hot water will dissolve all the residues, get them out of the barrel. A lot of folks will just take a, a hot pot of water or something, go outside, pull the barrels, pour hot water down the barrel, dry it out with a patch, follow it up with a couple of oily patches, and you're good to go. Uh, black powder cleanup is not that big of a deal, but it can be a hassle for some people that don't like to clean their guns readily when they get back from the range. So that's part of it. Yep. And again, for people who watch this channel, a lot of you guys might be able to relate that to corrosive AKMO. It's the same thing. I have videos where I literally pour boiling water down the barrel to show you guys the same concept. Yep. And all you're really doing corrosive. when you do that is you are actually using <clears throat> that hot water to dissolve those corrosive it's priming salt, salts. salts. It leaves yeah. behind those salts and you're you're basically melting them and then they're leaving the barrel along with the carrying fluid, which in this case is water. Water, water is nature solvent. Mm -hmm. If you can't clean it with hot water, then chances are it can't be cleaned. I mean, water is great for cleaning guns. Sure. You know, ultrasonics and things like that. Another thing about substitutes, and I've got a few notes I'm going on here. Mm -hmm. Substitutes generally are much hotter and faster burning and usually easier to ignite than standard black. So substitutes do have their advantages over traditional black powder. Um, another thing is how this stuff is measured and weighed. It's, it's all uh, pretty much divvied out by volume, not by weight. Now, I know this is going to be an obscure concept, so bear with me here. Okay, 100 grains of powder is 100 grains of powder. This is true. But if I take 100 grains of Pyrodex, 
stuff it in a case and shoot it. Now take 100 grains of real black powder and stuff it in a case and shoot it. The velocities of those two rounds might be very different. 100 grains is 100 grains is 100 grains, but because this powder may be hotter or because the granule size may be a little smaller or the burn rate might be slightly different, just because something's 1F doesn't necessarily mean the burn rate is that standard. It just means the granule size is that standard. So 1F uh, Swiss versus 1F German Stutzen might be, you might get two different velocities out of that cartridge even though both are 1F. And that's similar in smokeless powder too. And Dif that is different powders burn exactly. at different rates. So. But it would be the equivalent, the best way to think about it is, okay, say you have IMR 4350 smokeless powder. Yep. All right, now what if everybody that sold rifle powder called their powder IMR 4350? That would get a little bit confusing, right? Absolutely. Because you would think, all right, well, which IMR 4350? Well, we know because we're hand loaders, there's only one IMR 4350. It's that brand of powder and that's it. But what if every rifle powder, just as a rifle powder, was called 4350? So after a while, you'd be like, well, wait a minute. This one produces a little more velocity, a little less velocity. So between substitutes and real black, that's something you really want to keep in, in mind that you might get some velocity shift. Uh, you do not want to, you always want to back off on the charge with substitutes. Let's say your favorite muzzle loader shoots 100 grains of 1F or 2F, perfect. And it's like, man, that's my pet load. But I went down to the local sporting goods store and all I could find was substitute. You don't want to load 100 grains of substitute in there and just call it good. It's not going to hurt the gun. It's not going to destroy the gun. Probably won't hurt anything, but you could, you're definitely gonna get a little more pressure and a little more velocity. So when you're switching powders, always, just like smokeless, start back down and work your way back up to that sweet spot and find out where it needs to be. Cool. So that's part of that. Um, projectiles, that's one thing we didn't talk about. We talked about ignition systems, we talked about powders. Um, projectiles generally, uh, for use in black powder firearms, are generally gonna be made out of just pure lead. Uh, you're not gonna shoot a lot of jacketed bullets out of uh, muzzle loaders. A lot of muzzle loaders will use a patched round ball. Okay. Now here's another foreign concept and a lot of people get this wrong and I'm just trying to uh, explain it as best I can. So you take a patch and a round ball and that gets seated in there and that patch kind of grabs the ball and the rifling. When the, when the powder expands that patch is being forced against the ball and if it's rifled it's going to impart some spin so a lot of your old Kentucky style rifles, usually they're percussion cap guns, they'll take a patched round ball. So a lot of your old school guns take a patched round ball. Some guns will take a conical. This is a Kamalotter conical that's intended for a Norwegian, actually it's for this Norwegian Kamalotter back here. Okay. This is a very, very old gun. It's about 150 years old. It shoots this. Okay. All right, so in the case of a conical, uh, oftentimes conicals will just have lube grooves that are filled with lubricant mm -hmm. and uh, it's always generally going to be a lead projectile with a few exceptions. And the lubricant is to get it down in there, correct? The Not lubrication out. actually helps keep the fouling soft. Okay. So what the lubrication does is it's supposed to keep lead and fouling from sticking to the bore quite as bad. And as the each adjacent shot <clears throat> goes through the barrel, it's supposed to pull a lot of that stuff out and prevent it from really sticking to the bore. So you don't really have as much fouling gathering in the barrel. Without proper lubrication, without good patching and wadding and things like that, you can get a lot of fouling buildup, which will affect accuracy and can also affect the ability to get the, the ball down the barrel at all. If there's too much buildup, you <clears> gotta seat the bullet and you're like, dang, this thing won't even go down the barrel because there's too much fouling. Right, and could that be a safety issue as well? Yes. Okay. Okay. The reason it can be a safety issue, and that's a very good point you bring up, the reason it's a safety issue is because if that ball is not seated completely against the charge, if you have an air gap between the powder and the bullet, that's a big no-no. You do not want that. You always have to ensure that there's no air space or gap between the charge and the bullet because it can actually cause an extreme pressure spike. And in some instances, especially on the top end of a charge, if you're going for a hotter charge, can physically damage the gun. Right. And worse, can even blow the gun up depending on the situation, especially in a cartridge contained black powder round. If I load a 4570, and let's just say, oh, well, 70 grain hurts my shoulder when I shoot it, right. I'm gonna load 50. <clears throat> okay, fine, load 50. But if the bullet seats and there's that much gap, guess what? You could blow your gun up. So be very careful about that gap. You do not want any space between the charge and the bullet. 
Another type of projectile, now this would be the type of projectile uh, that you would run in the inline using the 209. This is the type of bullet we were shooting out of the Maxim. Right, and that's like the most the modern day. incarnation of, exactly. of the Exactly. Now motor. this is a more modern uh, bullet. Now it's still lead. This is a bore lock bullet from Federal, and uh, it basically just uses a sabot. And what happens when the expanding gas pressures push against this bullet, these things seat real easy because they're under bore diameter. When the gas yeah. pressures expand, this sabot grabs the rifling and imparts spin on the bullet. This is a more modern bullet. Right. This is not the kind of bullet you would shoot out of an old school rifle. This is sure. a modern bullet. So you've got passed round ball, conicals, and then a modern sabot bore riding bullet. Sure. So there's your, your basic projectile types. Cool. Um, cool. That's so pretty much black powder shooting in a nutshell. I mean, there are a lot of little things to consider, but 101, this should point people kind of in the right direction. Is there like a good place to go and find all this load data, or is it just books, or is there like a website that lists um, it all out? It, it's primarily books. Okay. I mean, um, the, the Lyman Black Powder Manual is a really good place mm. to look first. Um, they, they produce a black powder manual. It's like 20 bucks. If you're interested in black powder shooting, and let's just say it's a little intimidating to you, there are a lot of safety things that go over in there that is wonderful, and it's a great read. And for 20 bucks, definitely worth getting for $20, just in case. Uh, it's always good to read up on something like this before you get into something. For one, you don't want to buy the wrong components and be pissed off because you got money tied up in something you can't use. Sure, sure. Um, trying to think of some other things. So one thing that I had when, in terms of a question when I saw people shooting black powder is why the heck would anyone do that when you have modern stuff? So a few reasons I can think of is number one, it's kind of cool and nostalgic. You already brought that up, right? <laughs> to have the black powder, to smell it. Uh, being around it is very cool. Um, in a lot of states, uh, every state's different, of course, check your laws, but they have black powder hunting seasons where you can only hunt certain game with black powder. So that's a huge draw. And then something, correct me if I'm wrong, that I understand is that um, in terms of like uh, FFL transfers and stuff, some black powder guns don't go through that. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so that's also something that, I mean, a lot of people like that, not having to put their name on a form and send it to the government is an appeal to a lot correct. of people. So. All right, and then in some cases, to add to that, some firearms can only be fired with black powder, right. period. So now granted, <clears> if you're not a black powder guy, then you wouldn't buy a black powder gun, so that wouldn't be a problem. It's not like you're gonna buy an AR and it's like, oh, you can we use black powder in this AR? I mean, that's not the case. <laughs> But, I mean, like if I buy this old under lever here, obviously if I don't shoot black powder, there's no reason I'd buy this gun because it's black powder game, right? Mm -hmm. So the other thing to, to kind of mention there and what makes a lot of sense you mentioned, black powder guns, yes, oftentimes they can be shipped straight to your front door. They're not considered firearms. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of antiques are not considered firearms. So if a black powder gun is with an antique status, um, it is not a firearm, and in a lot of cases, even a cartridge-contained black powder gun, mm -hmm. like a Martini Henry, even a trapdoor, um, you know, it may even have been a former military gun, is still can ship straight to your front door because under under the laws, it's considered an antique, which means according to federal law, it is not considered a firearm. There are a couple of other things like you can buy, um, you know, basically cap and ball revolvers, and then they sell um, conversion cylinders for them. So like you order like a Uberti cap and ball revolver and then order a 45 Colt conversion cylinder and guess what? You've got a centerfire modern gun that ships straight your front door. It's like the original Palmer 80. Yeah. <laughs> but so like from 1880. It just depends on the way you look at it. So um, yeah, we mentioned that uh, black powder is measured by volume, mm -hmm. uh, not weight. I will elaborate on that mm -hmm. a little bit more because I think some people are probably going to ask about that. Uh, I, I kind of jumped around and didn't really mention sure. that. So basically you have volumetric powder measures. Um, yes, 100 grains is 100 grains. If I individually weigh every single one of these charges on a digital scale and it's 100 grains, then it's 100 grains. Grains is a weight measurement. There's 7,000 grains in a pound, okay? So you do the math, you figure that out. Um, so grains is a measurement. No matter what, there's always 7,000 grains in a pound. So yes, you can measure it uh, you know, by weight but it's traditionally measured by volume. So you have a volumetric powder measure. Now this is just a 4440 case, but we're gonna use this as an example. If I take this 4440 case and I fill it full of powder and I just go and just clear it off, that is a volume of powder, okay? Yes, it's gonna have a weight that it falls into. Yes, it's gonna be a fairly somewhat consistent weight. At the end of the day, I mean, yes, it's weighed by volume traditionally, 
but guess what? It's still a determined weight of powder, okay? Not all powder measures are made the same. You cannot put black powder in your charge master. You can't put black powder in a powder measure that is intended for smokeless powder because this is a static issue. Guys, it's an explosive. If you get some static, boom, your powder measure blows up. You don't want that. They make special powder measures intended just for black powder, and then they use a drop tube. It's this just long tube that goes out of the bottom of the uh, measure. Okay. And when you drop the powder, what happens is the powder drops down this tube and it gets all of the air and voids and space out of the charge. So it allows those granules to fall into the brass when you charge it. If you're charging a case, say you're charging a, I don't know, 4570 or a Martini Henry or whatever the heck you're shooting. You charge that case, those granules fall and they fill the case up gradually as they fall and it ensures that that charge is, is, is nice and compacted and consistent in the case as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. Whereby if I just took a volumetric powder measure, cleaned it off and poured it in there, it may not be the same from pour to pour as it would if I poured it through a volumetric or through a powder measure with a drop tube. So that's something to consider. Drop tubes give you a more consistent fill of the powder in the cartridge. So there's a lot of little intricacies, guys, that go into this kind of stuff. I mean, I'm not claiming to be an expert. I'm not claiming to know everything, but I have been shooting black powder a long time and I've never blown a gun up, and That's I've never good. blown myself up. I still have all my fingers and toes and all my eyeballs here, I think. Uh, so, you know. I got another question for you before we wrap it up. So these, sure. what, uh, are, what are we looking at here? So right. I, I didn't know these existed until he showed these to me. So. Okay, yeah. This is another powder type, guys, that I forgot to mention that Mike uh, was live to point out here. These are white hots, and basically what these are is pelletized black powder. So... <clears throat> Basically, the way it works is each of these represents 50 grains. Okay. So if I want to shoot 150 or 100 grain charge, there's two of those. Right. Simple. So pellet charges are a little bit better for like when you're in the field because you can just carry around. Like say I wanted to, it's a good example. All right. So say yeah. I wanted to. Uh, when I saw these, I was kind of like, well, I might get a muzzle loader then. Because <laughs> before that, I was like, right. Man. So say this tube here. All right. Say I want to be able to make a speed loader out of this. Sure. All right. There's my bullet. There's my charge, okay? I put that in my pocket. All right, bang, I shoot, I wanna reload. Pop, down the hatch. Guess what, no messy powder to get everywhere. Yep. The, two, the two pellets are gonna go down the muzzle, followed by the projectile, and then that's what's going off. And then cap it and it's ready to shoot again. Yep. So you can make kind of a, a quick and easy little speed loader um, out of the pellets. Yep. Pellets so are supposed to burn cleaner. Yep. They're supposed to provide a little bit better, more consistent velocities. Some people swear by pellets. Most of your modern shooters that shoot black powder for sporting purposes or for hunting uh, tend to use a rig very much like this. Uh, modern bullet, the most modern version of the powder you can get, and move on with life. Yeah, that's probably what I would do if I end up getting one. It's okay. um, so for like the powders, I know obviously like you said they're classified as explosives. Can you mm -hmm. buy that at like Cabela's and have it shipped to you or no? Or do you have no. to actually go into the store? Okay, so a lot of people ask me this and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned this, that's a great question. Um, black powder generally has to be ordered online through a specialty house and you have to pay okay. hazmat on it. Okay. Um, a lot of them, depending on how much powder you're trying to order, will generally cut you a break. Like the hazmat's gonna be the same whether you order two pounds or whether you order 30. Some companies will cut you off at a certain amount. Like I order my black powder through Buffalo Arms um, you can order, I think, up to 30 pounds on one hazmat. That's a lot of powder. It's going to take you a long time to go through 30 pounds, and they'll also let you mi uh, mix and match on what you want. So, like, say I need, say I don't go through a lot of 4F, so I only want to order two pounds of 4F, but I want to order 10 pounds of 1F, and, you know, and, and the, the, the surplus of everything else, I just want to mix up between 2, 3, and 1F powder. I can do that. You can mix and match, put the order together. Now, the hazmat's like, I don't know, $22 on top of the shipping cost. Okay. So they do have to have special handling and everything like that. And most, the reason I mentioned earlier, most gun shops don't stock real black powder because of the storage requirements. Sure. Uh, they have to have like a special, ba basically kind of like an explosives magazine. In case the powder goes off, it's supposed to contain the fire and ish, you know, all the crap that, I guess the potential pressure, the vessel that that powder is put in is designed in a way that it can't blow up and physically come apart and create a, a bomb out of the container that the powder is in. 
And most uh, gun shops just don't want to mess with the storage requirements right. to keep it in stock. Can't blame them for that. Yeah, but you, in theory, yes, you could find a gun shop that stocks real black powder, but chances are probably not. You're going to have to order it. Cool. Okay. Um, I think that covers all my questions, but again, like we said in the onset that we just sort of wanted to cover 101 here. If you guys have more questions, like you said, the manual, I'm going to put a link to that down below so you guys can check that out. But there are tons of information out there. There's forums. Like anything else on forums, you have to decipher who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. Sure. But the information's out there. If you guys belong to like local gun ranges, there's probably a guy there who knows what he's talking about black powder. Seek these folks out, um, as I've done here, and build your knowledge up so that way you don't have to be intimidated by it. Because I can tell you, I was. And literally every time I watch a new video, I learn a little bit more and it gets less intimidating. So, yeah. I mean, nowadays there's so much information out there. Seek it out and uh, you guys should be good to go. Yeah, I mean, everything is new to everybody <clears throat> at some point in their life. I mean, uh, when I got into black powder, I was a little bit intimidated, but I knew it was something I really wanted to do. I love shooting old school guns, and I knew eventually I was going to come across a score of different older guns that I have to use black powder to shoot them. So sometimes it's a necessity because of the type of guns you like to shoot. Sometimes it's a necessity because you just got to squeeze that extra week out of hunting season that yep. you get to use black powder. Sometimes you just want to hang out and shoot some cool, old, nostalgic stuff. It's not for everybody. Uh, certainly not for everybody. But, uh, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, we, we hope you enjoyed the video, and hopefully I gave a, a somewhat decent explanation. No, it was pretty good. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of this video. Hopefully you yeah. share it with other people who want, want the knowledge. But big thanks to uh, Eric for having me down here. Um, I've been watching his channel since probably since he started. And back then, you were doing a ton of reloading videos. That was a ton of it. Um, and learned a lot from those as well. So if you guys aren't following his channel, subscribe, go ahead and check it out. He does a lot of videos like this with a lot of very detailed knowledge and uh, breaks it down Barney style, which I truly appreciate. So check his stuff out if you guys haven't. And thanks again for having me down. Thank you to all of you for watching. Truly appreciate it and hope to see all of you guys in the next video.